Guys, welcome to another video. You've got Mr. Everything English. And today, guys, today we're going to fix a problem that drives me absolutely insane. It's January 2022 and exams are about four or five months away. And I'll be teaching and I'll say, guys, give me a quote from Inspector Cords. Give me a quote from Macbeth and it makes me feel as though I'm sitting in a library because it's absolutely pin drop silent. If you're a student <clears throat> and you're seeing your exams in May, June time and you don't know your quotes, what are you waiting for guys? What are you waiting for? Because if you don't know your quotes, you can't analyze any effects which means you can't answer any GCSE questions. However, however, that being said, I guys have decided that I'm going to make a few videos where I'm going to give you the quotes that you need to learn off by heart. I'm just going to give you them and I'm going to briefly break down each quote as to what you're supposed to say about it. Now you only need to learn 10 quotes. I've had some teachers say learn 30 quotes, learn 40 quotes. Guys, no one's got time for that and that's a massive task. If we're learning 30, 40 quotes per text, that means we're learning approximately 100-ish, 120 quotes. That's not feasible. When I give my advice, guys, I like to make it realistic. So I'm going to give you guys 10 quotes from Macbeth. Learn these 10 quotes and forget about everything else. Just learn these 10 because in the exam, they will give you an extract which will have quotes in it already. And then if you've learned the 10 that I'm going to give you now, that is enough for you to produce four paragraphs, two on the extract, two on the whole text. Now guys, these quotes are from different characters and they can be applied to a range of characters and a range of themes. So for example, just because Lady Macbeth is the one that says unsex me here, we can also use that quote about the witches and the supernatural and so on. So don't look at quotes as one dimensional. Look at quotes as having different purposes. So these 10 quotes, guys, are from different characters and are from different themes. And therefore, they can be applied to different exam questions. Guys, I'm begging you, learn your quotes. I'm going to give you 10 quotes. If you learn one quote a day for the next 10 days, by the end of the 10th day, you're done. None of these quotes are very long. I've written, guys, I've got them in front of me. On purpose, I've chosen realistic quotes that you can remember. Now guys, I'm an old man. You guys are way younger than me. If I can learn these quotes off by heart, trust me, so can you. Now, without further ado, guys, let's begin. The first quote, guys, that I'm gonna use, guys, is from Act 1, Scene 2, and it is said by Ross. And Ross says, guys, this is when we first introduce Macbeth. He says, brave Macbeth, well, he deserves that name. Now, guys, this quote can be used to talk about the character of Macbeth primarily, because you can see from the very beginning, Macbeth is seen in a very high regard by the king and the people he's surrounded with, because they say he is brave Macbeth. Number two, he deserves that name. He is not being called brave just because he's strong and muscular. He deserves it. He's put in the work. More in particular, he's been fighting for the king as a worthy and valiant soldier. However, as the play develops, this quote, guys, this quote, it can be used in two ways. Number one, it shows how the royals, in particular the king, were a terrible judge of character. Because the old Thane of Cordor betrays him and then Macbeth betrays him as well. But what's the bigger point here? How did they judge people? It's based upon the word brave. Patriarchy, guys. Patriarchy meant that a man's character wasn't judged upon his, his, his values. It wasn't judged upon how honest and trustworthy he was. It was judged upon his bravery. And just because Macbeth was seen as brave, they thought he must be perfect. 
because that was the measuring stick. That is how you judged the quality of a man. Number two, guys, this quote, you can argue, is also a little bit foreshadowing. What is it foreshadowing of? Brave Macbeth. Macbeth is brave on the battlefield. But what does the brave, what does the word brave mean? For me, guys, the word brave is the idea he's courageous, he's daring, he's willing to do things that others are not. Hence why he kills the king. Because brave Macbeth, yes, he's brave on the battlefield, but also his life, also in life, his bravery allows him to do things that maybe other characters would not have done so. Now, guys, at this point, I'm going to move on to quote number two, because if I go and give you guys thorough analysis of each quote, this video will be like 30, 40 minutes long. And I know you guys won't watch all of it. So quote number two, guys, is from Act 1, Scene 4. And it's just after Macbeth has been visited by the witches. And it's just after Macbeth has been told that he is now Thane of Cordor. What does he say? He says, let not light let not light and light here guys can be a metaphor for god can be a metaphor for people can be a metaphor for the people around him let not light see my dark and deep desires i love this quote why do i love it because this quote can be used to smack everyone on the head who says that lady macbeth influenced macbeth act one scene four is this quote macbeth already before he even meets Lady Macbeth, is having dark desires. Dark desires meaning he's thinking of doing things that are wrong, which means he's thinking of killing the king. But the important part, guys, they're dark, but they're deep inside him. They're almost a part of him. These thoughts, it's not just like a fart in the wind that you forget about it. These thoughts are stuck with him. Now, that's the first thing, guys, that it shows that Macbeth was already influenced. Macbeth was already thinking of certain things before meeting Lady Macbeth, before speaking to Lady Macbeth. But number two, guys, we learn a lot about the power of the supernatural. Look what they've done to Macbeth, brave Macbeth, and the guy who's willing to sacrifice his life for his country. Within one scene, act one, scene three, they were able to transform his entire character. So when we look at the change of Macbeth, you want to say Macbeth is changing, but the catalyst in science, guys, a catalyst speeds up the reaction. The catalyst for Macbeth's change is when he meets the witches because then he goes into overdrive. Let's then move the on to Mrs. Lady Macbeth, Act 1, Scene 5. And this is the famous quote. Now, I've added to it. People always quote, unsex me here. I've taken it further. Unsex me here and fill me from the crown to the toe. Top full of direst cruelty. Unsex me here, guys. Now, I've spoken about this so many times. She's not saying make me a man. Please don't put that in your exam. She wants to be a man. She's saying, reduce my femininity. Take away the qualities that make me feminine and make me more masculine. But she's not saying make me a man. Now, what were the qualities in that time that made a woman a woman? Being beautiful, being soft, being elegant, being stuck to your husband's arm like a trophy wife. What does she know she needs to be to become powerful? She needs to be evil. She needs to feel no emotion. She needs to sacrifice what means a lot to her, meaning her looks, her beauty. Unsex me here, right now, and fill me. Guys, she wants to be fully covered, fully immersed. She's willing to give it all. Fill me with what? Fill me from the crown, from the head to the toe. Fill me with direst cruelty. Fill me with the worst possible evil. Guys, this quote can be used for Lady Macbeth. This quote can be used for supernatural. This quote can be used for women in general. Where women were suffering so much because of patriarchy that for a woman to become powerful, she had to sacrifice so much. She had to become as masculine as possible. Number four, guys. Number four, number four, number four. And this is where Lady Macbeth is poking the bear Macbeth. Act one, scene seven. 
Macbeth, guys, he goes back and forth at the beginning of the play. He says, well, not he says, but he implies that he wants to kill the king. Then he backs out. Then he goes back and he commits. Then he backs out. The quote that you want to use that almost kills Macbeth, that almost captures Macbeth, is in Act 1, Scene 7, where Lady Macbeth says, When thou darest to do it, then you were a man. This is a quote that can be used to show the danger of patriarchy. I made a video guys on TikTok talking about how patriarchy oppresses man. And this is an example. For a patriarchal man, he had to be courageous. He had to be brave. He had to be brave and courageous, importantly, in the eyes of his wife. And Lady Macbeth knew that. And Lady Macbeth plays upon that. When Macbeth starts to have second thoughts, she basically calls him a coward. She basically says to him, guys, that if you dare to do it, if you dare to kill Macbeth, then I'll see you as a man. But until then, mate, you're just some emasculated creature that I can't even consider manly enough to be my husband. She hits him where it hurts. And that's what tips Macbeth over the edge. Arguably, it's an argument you can make. You can argue that Macbeth kills Duncan to prove his masculinity to his wife rather than his desire to be the king. That's just a possible argument. I'm not saying it's the truth, but in an essay, it's definitely worth a paragraph. That's four guys. Let's move on to quote number five. Um, guys, this one from Act 2, Scene 2. Just after Mr. Macbeth has killed Duncan, he comes back to Lady Macbeth and this brave man who's, who's used to killing and who's used to fighting for the king, he's in an absolute state and he's got blood all over his hands and blood is a metaphor for his guilt. He's carrying his guilt everywhere he goes and when he comes to his wife, he says to his wife, will all of great Neptune's ocean wash this blood clean from my hands? This quote guys, now again guys, I could do a whole video analyzing one quote, but I'm not gonna do that. This quote guys, you wanna use it for two main points. Number one, in act two, scene two, Macbeth feels really guilty. But as human nature goes, the first time you commit a bad deed, you feel like absolute poop. You feel terrible, but then you do it again. And then you do it again. And then you do it again. And by the fifth or sixth time, it doesn't feel as bad as it did the first time. By the 10th time, it's normal. It's just who you've become. And that's Macbeth, guys. Yes, Macbeth was used to killing, but he was used to killing in the army for the right reason. He's not used to killing an old man sleeping in bed. And when he kills Duncan, he feels guilt. But then he kills Banquo. Doesn't feel as guilty. Then he kills Lady Macduff. Doesn't feel guilt at all. He kills her son. Doesn't feel guilt at all. This, guys, Act 2, Scene 2, is the very rare moment until the end of the play, Act 5, Scene 2, where from Act 2, Scene 2 to Act 5, Scene 2, Macbeth becomes almost emotionless. And number two, guys, this quote can be linked to Act 5, Scene 1 when Lady Macbeth is trying to wash the blood off her hands. Um, it's almost irony that she tells Macbeth to basically get over it and she becomes like this. Now guys, we move on to my favorite quote of the play. It's in act five, scene two. It's my favorite quote, guys. Macbeth, by the end of the play, he shows a tiny bit of regret, a tiny bit of remorse, but he understands it's too late because the armies are outside the castle and they're not gonna have a conversation. He can't ask for forgiveness. They're gonna chop his head off, whether he fights or whether he surrenders. In act two, in act five, scene two guys, Macbeth says, out, out, brief candle. And brief candle guys can be a metaphor for life. He says, out, out, brief candle. Life is but a walking shadow. I love that quote, I love it. Life is but a walking shadow. You can never catch your shadow. You're always chasing your shadow. Now, what can the shadow here represent? Power, 
ambition, titles, kingship, money, respect, whatever we chase in life, whatever Macbeth chased, he's always chasing it because you always want more. First, <coughs> first he wanted to be king. Once he became king, he wanted to kill Banco and Fleance because he wanted his lineage to be king. It's a constant pursuit. It's a constant pursuit. You're always chasing the shadow, but you can never catch it. So Macbeth has a moment of realization. Before that, he says, life is but a candle. He, 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 he considers his mortality. This candle, guys, is a, is a metaphor for his life. And a candle, if it's on fire, if it's been lit, it's gonna burn. Either you blow it out or you naturally die. The wax finishes. Now Macbeth's candle is blown out by Macduff who chops his head off. But it's that point, guys, in Act 5, Scene 2, Macbeth, for the first time in the entire play, he's questioning, damn, was it all worth it? I'm gonna die soon. And I've been chasing a shadow that, that I can't catch. So for the first time, Macbeth has a, has a, has a sign of, of, of regret, has a sign of contemplation. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, number seven, guys. One, scene five. Lady Macbeth, look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. Two-faced, 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 two-faced. The queen of two faces tells Macbeth how to be. Look innocent, look beautiful, look happy, but be evil. Be a serpent. Be, be nasty. And that is what, why is someone knocking on my door? And that is what she is telling Macbeth to be. She is telling Macbeth to be as two-faced as possible. And then guys, it moves on to Act 3, Scene 2, where it says, guys, full of scorpions is my mind. Now guys, by the way, this is why I lock my doors when I record, but some people still want to get in by banging on the windows. Anyway, guys, full of scorpions is my mind. Uh, what was the saying, guys? This is Macbeth in Act 3, Scene 2. Full of scorpions is my mind. Full, covered. Now what are scorpions, guys? Scorpions are eating away at his mind. And this quote, guys, you want to use it for, for foreshadowing. This quote, guys, can be used to foreshadow that it will be the eventual downfall for Macbeth. He will lose his mind and that he definitely does. Fine, he never commits suicide. But his actions in Act 3 and Act 4 and Act 5, he's a man possessed by his, his hunger and his desire for power. And guys, let's move on to the final two quotes. I've chosen guys, act one, scene one, fear is foul and foul is fear. Why have I picked up this quote? Guys, I chose this quote because this quote summarizes the entire play. The entire play. Fear is foul, good is bad and bad is good. Everything in this play, morality is twisted up, it's not twisted, it's flipped upside down. What you expect doesn't happen. Brave Macbeth becomes nasty Macbeth. Confident and beautiful Lady Macbeth is a broken mess by the end. Everything in this play, guys, the supernatural, twist it and turn it upside down and they configure what the audience, what the reader, and what the characters know to be true by changing everything. And last guys is Banco. Banco guys in act one, scene three, he says that the witches are the instruments of darkness and they tell us truths, win us with honest trifles, only to betray us in deepest consequence. First things first guys, the instruments of darkness. An instrument is to be played, is telling us that the witches are gonna play Macbeth and Banquo. More importantly, they play Macbeth. They are the instruments of darkness. It's foreshadowing evil. It's foreshadowing that something terrible is about to happen. Now, I've analyzed this quote, guys, in my last few videos, so do check it out. Now, he admits that the witches will tell us truths, and it's juxtaposition. Something so evil, something so nasty will be so truthful. It's juxtaposition, but he says, they're gonna tell you truths not because they care about you, but because they want to win your trust. They want to win your, win your loyalty. And then once they pulled you in, it's foreshadowing now, that once they're going to pull you in, 
they're going to betray you and put you in the deepest consequence. Meaning, once you pull you in, they're going to drop you and you're going to suffer the consequences of trusting these witches. Look at Macbeth. He's like an addict. He's like a drug addict. And the witches are the dealer. He goes back for more. He goes back for more. And they pull him. And they pull him. And they pull him. And they tell him that no man born of a woman can harm you. And this gets Macbeth absolutely gassed. He thinks, you know what? No one's touching me. But they knew that Macduff wasn't born that way. And they pull and they pull. And once they got Macbeth exactly where they wanted him, he is absolutely destroyed. Guys, this quote foreshadows the entire play. They're going to pull you in and they're going to drop you when they need to. Guys, those 10 quotes, those are the 10 quotes. Have I given you 10? Yes. Guys, those are the 10 quotes that I recommend you learn for your exam. Now, there may be other teachers, other people saying learn other 10. That's fine. It is what it is. But in my opinion, guys, these 10 quotes, just these 10 are enough. Learn these 10, learn what they mean, learn what language and structural devices are inside them, and then do past papers using these quotes. And that's it, guys. You will smash your exams. 10 is enough. For our GCSEs, guys, 10 is the magic number. All right, guys, I'll end this video here. I hope you found it beneficial. Let me go check on the door to see who's knocking. As always, guys, it's been Mr. Everything English. Thank you for your support. Peace.